My name is Brian Mason, and I want to welcome you to uh, another edition of this thing that we're doing. Um, I, we're just talking to people that have interesting stories to tell, and when it comes to stories, I can't think of a better guy. We could probably do six hours and just barely skim the surface with our, our guests today. I'm going to have to put my glasses on because the font's too small. This guy was vice president with Verb Records, uh, vice president of marketing with MGM Records. Uh, he was a, 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 a manager at Capital EMI. He was a president of Bar Barnaby CVS Records. And also, and probably not most important necessarily, but uh, as far as our story is concerned, he was the hand-picked president no. of you. Apple. No, what? U.S. manager. Well, I handpicked manager. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I've told people. Anyway, Ken Mansfield <laughs> is here with yeah. us. Ken, welcome. Yeah. I've told people for years you were the president of Apple in the U.S. That's yeah. not right? No, it's not right. I was U.S. manager. In fact, the Beatles were very funny about titles. And uh, I cringe every time somebody misquotes. I was speaking in Minneapolis at a church one time, and Paul McCartney was in concert there. And the newspaper, the main newspaper there, did a story on me and gave me all this, like I founded Apple, I taught the Beatles how to play, the, you know, all this stuff. And I'm going, right. I called the newspaper, I was freaking out, because that's all McCartney had to, because uh, I was using the name of my, my event tour was The Beatles, The Bible, and Beyond. And I thought, oh, great, because... Uh, <laughs> you He's were gonna, already yeah, borrowing and, uh, the Beatles. I'm, I'm out there. Paul will think I'm out there telling him, but I was the president of Apple and founded the, you know, all these things. That and by golly, they, got, they pulled it at night before they went on press. Wow. I, I couldn't believe it. I was freaking out. Well, I saw it. where you've been credited to being the Beatles manager yeah. before. But oh, been, that's... Well, I was U.S. manager of Apple and not the Beatles. And right. so... But anyway, you, I, gave, I gave up trying to correct it one day because pe <laughs> people want you to be, you know, whatever they want you to be. Right. So it, it was pretty hard. But, but you were handpicked. I did get that part. Yeah, right. absolutely. And I was quite a surprise. I wasn't expecting it. Um, real, uh, real, how it happened was uh, I'd worked with them in 65 on the 65 tour because I was the head of promotion for Capital for the West Coast. And whenever a band came in the area... Uh, they were my responsibility, and Capital was a very, very straight label about their job descriptions. And so, I worked with the Beatles. Now, usually a higher executive would snag that up, but because that was my job, and I worked with them in '65, and uh, they uh, had a day off, and were doing the press conference, and uh, they were just getting tired of the same old questions. Brian Epstein was one end of the podium, and I was book en bookending them at the other end of the podium. And George happened to be on the end, and he turned over and he started just asking me questions. And uh, pretty soon, Paul was doing it too. And so finally, Paul said, look at Mal, give Ken the address, and are you doing anything tomorrow? You want to come up and hang around? Because they want to know more. They just want to know things. It was their first time that they had a day off on tour in Hollywood, in L.A. Wow. And so Paul wanted to know uh, if he could get some Gene Vincent records because Gene Vincent was on Capitol. Uh, John wanted to know where um, Grumman's Chinese Theater was and <laughs> and George about Mulholland Drive and just all the typical things like that. Good Ringo tourists. wanted to know if I could introduce him to Buck Owens because Buck was on Capitol. Right. And uh, so they were just didn't have time to do that during the press conference, so they said, come up to the house. I hung around the next day. Uh, around the pool with him. And uh, it was just really fun, very casual. This girl swam by and the long black hair was Joan Baez and, <laughs> and just, you know, just stuff like that. And so, okay, the next year they came back and I thought, well, that was exciting. But they got off the plane, hey, Ken. And that just floored me that they would remember after the millions of people they met. I worked with them in that in 66 then and something was very different. Uh, the boyish, childish, or not childish, but uh, childlike thing wasn't happening anymore. Now, I didn't know at the time that San Francisco was going to be the end of the touring. I had no idea. But uh, so I'm working with them this time, and I think, you know what? I think I'm going to end up working with these guys because we just hit it off. I was an executive, and uh, I was also a young guy in his, their 20, in my 20s, 
like them, and they weren't used to work because everybody they worked with was a chairman of the board, a BMI, or you know, was all the something. all the big the suits and stuff. Yeah. And here's this young guy that's got a Cadillac convertible and you know all this kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and so uh, anyway, so put them on the plane and they go up to San Francisco, and you know that's the, the his end of that story. But uh, two years, I didn't hear a word. I thought, well, that little dream was a fun little fantasy, right? And then uh, they start putting together Apple and uh, the Apple record label. The Apple record label. And so when that was in motion, Paul came over and I spent a few days with Paul and we did the convention and we did all that stuff. We'd, and we made the deal with to distribute. Any record label could have had Apple, but Capital had the calling card and we had history with them. But number one, is we could distribute Apple and the Beatles could be on Apple. Now, see, if they had gone with RCA, right. they would have still been on Capitol and their artists would have been, their the label. Art, Apple artists. Artists. So, uh, and my understanding is if you look at the records, the original records on uh, Apple, it's actually a Capitol Records accounting number on there. So it's, you know, the, the measure of sales and all that, so... Wow. But um, so I worked with Paul and Ron Cass came over. Ron Cass and I became really good friends. Ron, that time. Ron was who? Ron Cass was the president of Apple That's Records. Good, 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 got the title right. He was in London, the he capital London. of Apple. Yeah. Okay. And he was the head of the, for the president of, of Apple. And so they go over there. And the funny thing is, is um, I had a, Paul gave me a medallion. I, I, he had this medallion. And I said, that is really cool. So I put him on the plane, and he turns around, and he says, here. And he puts it around my neck. And he said, is that the medallion? Uh, yeah. No, that's my own medallion. Oh, that's your own. <laughs> yeah. well, that was the day of medallions. Yeah, but, okay. and, uh, well, we'll share this picture a little bit later yeah. on then. But yeah, this is okay, a- that picture, if you'll notice, uh, is one of my favorite pictures. It looks like it's choreographed. Look at our feet. You're look insane. at our hands. Look at our eyes. You're look insane. at everything. It's just identical. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so, and he said, uh, uh, here, and he said, maybe the next time I see, oh, and I, I tell him, Paul, gee, I've never been to Europe and all this. I really hope I go there someday, innocently. So he puts it on my neck. And he said, maybe the next time I see this will be in London. And that was, okay, he left. And then it was within a couple of weeks, they called and asked me to, to be the U.S. manager and brought me over to London to, to finish setting up Apple and, the, and all the stuff we were going to do. And was that the meetings in Hyde Park? In the hotel? That was the meetings in Hyde Park, Good. yeah. Now I've got the actual, I've got some pictures <laughs> oh. that, uh, that we'll be sharing then. Okay. So this, this shot, can yeah. you remember this? Yes, I do. This is the most successful, probably richest band in the world at the time. We have taken a small hotel suite in uh, on Hyde Park, so you can see how crammed up we are. Uh, that's Ron Cass there, and this is the back of George Harrison's head. And then in this shot, I don't know if you can see John's leg. John and Yoko are sitting on a couch over here. Okay. And then Peter Asher and Neil Aspinall and Larry Delaney from Capitol joined us also was back here. And we were in this circle, and we were in there for days like that. Really? I mean, you can see how close I'm sitting with you. Yeah, and You're I'm sandwiched between. I'm Ringo this and young, Paul. young, naive guy. I don't think anything about it because I was kind of a. Well, uh, I admit I was a hot shot at the time. I was coming up through Capital fast, and and uh, I don't know. I thought I was kind of a big deal, it was just like they were, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, so I was comfortable with. I think that's why we hit it off so well because, uh, first of all, I didn't quite get it. The, about the Beatles being so big, I just didn't. I just I thought they were another rock band. I'd work with them. In fact, uh, somewhere along the way, I told Ringo, I said, I can't wait someday for this Beatle thing to be over with, because I turned out kind of liking Ringo best, you know. Well, yeah. And uh, I said, so then we can just hang out with all this Beatle stuff. He's still a Beatle, you know. Okay. You still wait? Have for you that asked day, aren't me a you? question yet? <laughs> No, I'm just letting you go, letting you, letting okay. you have at it. Um, no, but that that was um, that had to be a fascinating thing. So that was your first time to London when you were mm. setting up the Apple Apple label stuff. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and to think about it, um, 
because I was in promotion, and when Peter and Gordon started hitting, right, uh, they flew into L.A. to to do promotion and stuff like that. Oh, I'm the guy that picked them up. That was my job, right. And uh, so we became friends. And then to think years later, I fly into London, and who picks me up at the airport? Peter. Peter Asher. Asher. <laughs> and uh, yeah, except uh, I picked him up in my my Thunderbird. Which was a real big sure. car, car then, yeah. and he he picked me up in a white Rolls Royce with a <laughs> with a chauffeur that was assigned to us twenty four hours a day. Go back to something you were talking about a moment ago. You didn't really get them in the very no. beginning. Your your interests um, were more in the folk scene, and yeah. uh, I mean that was the day of the Hootenannies and yeah. that kind yeah. of stuff. In fact, you had been in a band. Yeah, a part of that. We were just coming out of the Hootenanny. Uh, thing and Capital was just coming out of the four freshmen: George Shearing, Stan Kenton, Peggy Lee, uh, you know, all these kind of great acts, Nat King Cole, and et cetera. Right. And we were moving into now we had the Beatles and the Beach Boys, and we were transitioning and and developing Glenn Campbell and Lou Rawls and and Bobby Gentry and all these kind of acts. Nancy Wilson, Linda Ronstadt. We uh, had Linda in the group called the Stone Ponies, but. <clears throat> I forgot the question was, but we were... Oh, so music tastes were changing then. So I came out of the folk thing. And uh, the thing that changed my life forever as far as music go was Bill Haley and the Comets with Rock Around the Clock. The first time I heard that. And then I heard the next thing I heard that changed my life in the music. And I think these are the things, without realizing, made me migrate to the business. I never tried to migrate to the business, but when I heard Les Paul's How High the Moon, and because uh, later on I became a producer for for 30 years, and I think I heard stacking for the first time, you know, multiple. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I didn't know what I was hearing, but something about it fascinated me. And so wow, those were the records that drew me. And here I am. I'm growing up next to an Indian reservation and in northern Idaho, how do you get from there <laughs> to a rooftop in to London? To a rooftop in London, and to, to, which we'll get to that in just, okay. in just a moment. Um, I'm just going to tell you my life story. I know, here, I know. You, you know what? We only got, <laughs> I've got a few questions to ask, but okay. I haven't even started the list okay. yet. I got to, I got to tighten up here. <laughs> it's okay. No, I'm enjoying every every moment of this, as I always do uh, yeah. with you. Um, but you were definitely a four freshman fan. Oh gosh. I love the four freshmen. And, you know, as you know, that uh, Brian Wilson was a giant four freshman fan. And that's my understanding is the reason the Beach Boys stacked their vocals because right. four freshmen put the lead up on top and right. build underneath it. Or, yeah, anyway. Incredible harmonies. Uh, yeah. So I'm a giant four freshman fan. And now I'm working at Capitol. And now I'm working with a four freshman. You could have stopped right there. I was in heaven with that. <laughs> Uh, and you got paid. And I got paid and be, became friends with because their manager was a guy that sponsored me. He saw me, met me in clubs that I was working uh, when I was, um, I had a nightclub in San Diego. And anyway, I was looking for acts and th- he was out there for capital and managing the four freshmen looking for acts and stuff. And so when this opening came up, he remembered, because I had a, also had a college degree by that time. And so he asked me one day, if I sponsored you, would you come up and interview for a job at Capitol? And I got the job. There were 40 guys that volunteered for that job at Capitol because it was the plum of all the jobs. Hollywood, uh, based there, and your job was to hang out with artists, go to concerts, go to clubs, uh, take (laughs) people to dinner, you know, just this. Yeah, it's And I, I got the job. I interviewed against 40 people that had experience yeah, that had been in the industry. And you had yeah. to borrow a suit for the interview, didn't I you? I borrowed my – I didn't have any clothes except my hippie, uh, you know, <laughs> club clothes and all that kind of stuff. And his, this rich friend of mine, his dad was a, on vacation, and he took me to his house. His dad was about four inches shorter than me and about uh, 50 pounds heavier than me. And he has these expensive suits and all that. So I borrowed his suit, and we uh, tucked it in the back, and – and made it fit there, and and uh, just let the pants do what they had to do, and uh, tucked. And then I borrowed his Rolex watch, and 
So I, when I'm interviewed in somebody else's clothes and somebody else's watch, and I got the job got anyway. The job. <laughs> That's great. And uh, so I'm leading to something. So now I'm working with the four freshmen. This was the days when we had Shindig and Hullabaloo and uh, Ninth Street West and all these different TV shows. And so the four freshmen were trying to maintain their career, and they got booked on, uh, I think it was Sam Riddle's uh, Ninth Street, Ninth Street West, I'm not sure. Live show, L.A. Yeah, yeah. but After they were lip sync. Okay. So uh, I get we get a call. We're in the studio. We're going to go on about, they're going to go on about 50 minutes. I'm standing there with the manager, and he gets a phone call. And he hangs up the phone, and he says, Don Barber, the lead singer, was just in an accident on the Hollywood freeway. He's not hurt, but he, he, he can't be he here. It. And so I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, the other three freshmen and Bill Wagner uh, looking at me. <laughs> they said, oh, so you know all our songs. <laughs> huh? Because uh, you were a big fan. Yeah. I said, well, yeah, you know. I he said, here's John's, Don's jacket. <laughs> and so I'm standing lip sync. It didn't matter, you know, because I knew the song. And yeah. I'm lip sync. I thought, I'm one of the four freshmen. I'm one of the four. <laughs> on television. And, and once again, in borrowed clothes. Yes, so. in borrowed clothes. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Anyway. Wow. Okay, another long answer to a short no, question. No, 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 yeah. no. No, I, I love it dearly. <laughs> um, I want you to tell the story because did – when was Hey Jude? That was recorded in 68. Was that the trip when you went to London? Is that the same trip that Hey Jude was? No. Uh, oh, yes. I'm sorry. It is. Okay. Yeah. So they had already recorded Hey Jude. Yes. Now, radio in those days, pop top forty radio songs were fifth, uh, three minutes, maybe maybe no, three and a half, two and a half, two and no, a half, yeah, and but half. nothing more than three three and a half minutes. Yeah. That's the max. Yeah. So um, here comes Hey Jude at what seven twenty seven, seven yeah. and a half or so, um, but it's the Beatles. So tell this story because this is wonderful. And uh, I grew up in Miami, so this is, yeah. Uh, there's a a part of this story oh, that that's I'm, right, yeah, because yeah. we've talked about it. Yeah. Um, well, so in setting up Apple, uh, part of my responsibilities became I was going to set up a special promotion team separate for the Beatles, promote their records and Apple Apple records. And uh, so part of the process while I was there, we were going to pick the four, first four records to be released on Apple, which they had done which was uh, Jackie Lomax, uh, Sour Milk Sea, Eagle Laughs at You, Mary Hopkin, those were the days, I forget the backside, a band that Paul wanted to call uh, the Black Dyke Mills Band yeah. and Thingamabob. Thingamabob, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And then the Beatles. And they had selected uh, Revolution and Hey Jude. But they, Paul, now Paul's a businessman. Right. Well, in America, the record's going to be two and a half minutes to get an airplay, and I've got a seven-minute record here. And so we kept playing. We were sitting. We didn't have furniture in the Apple building yet, and so we had a big sound system in one of the big rooms there and new green carpet, and we're sitting on the floor, and they're just playing Hey Jude and Revolution over and over again, trying to decide. And Paul was a, just, he was just afraid nobody would play it. And I said, Paul, you know, you're the Beatles. You can burp and they're going to play it. <laughs> but he was still afraid for launching their first record on their new label that it wouldn't get played. So I said, look, I have an idea. If you will trust me with an acetate, and that was a big deal to be trusted with anything with the Beatles because I could have sold that thing for, you know, oh, or whatever. Yeah. But, or anybody could. So I said, if you will trust me with an acetate, when I fly back to L.A., I will hopscotch back. I'll fly in to uh, F Philadelphia because the top music people that pick the hit records in America, there happened, happened to be a guy, Jim Hilliard, in Philadelphia. Radio guy. Radio guy, WFIL. And I said, I'll go there and play it for Jim. Then I'll go down to Miami to WQAM and a guy down there, Jim Dunlap. Right. And he's a good guy at picking records. I'll play it for him. Then I'm going to fly to St. Louis, and I forget the guy there. And then I'll fly to L.A. and play it for Dick, uh, Dick Moreland at KRLA. And see, I'll get four solid opinions, what they think about it. Well, 
every one of them just virtually fell on the floor. And I had to watch them like a hawk to make sure there was nothing running that somebody was, you know, right. running. So I get back to L.A. and I call Paul and I said, um, hey, everybody said, it's a, you know, it's a go, man. He said, okay, biggest single they ever had, I think. I think so. I, yeah. Yeah. But it had that kind of a history to getting out on the radio. Because, I mean, I didn't, Revolution, I don't know. It didn't sound like a hit to me. No, no. And sometimes, you know, well, I, yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's astounding. And, of course, because a station wouldn't play it, it wouldn't mean necessarily everybody would love that song. They just might be afraid to put seven minutes on, yeah. on radio. Yeah. But when those programmers who knew what they were doing. Well, we did have MacArthur Park before that. That's a good point. And we had... Uh, Oh, what was it? Was it Baker Street? Was that before that or after uh, that? Rafferty's, Jerry Rafferty. Yeah, that was after. That was that like was pretty long. Mid seventies. Yeah. Got it to beat it. Oh, remember. yeah. Was it? But they of course chopped that up. It was like twenty minutes, yeah. but they chopped it into something shorter. Now that's an interesting observation. Not once during that time did was it ever discussed about shortening the record, to taking the coda out mm-hmm. or, or it, a verse nothing. out or whatever. That was never even a part of the discussion. It was either. And it wasn't even said, well, it's either this or nothing. It was just never a part of the conversation. Now, on a personal level, what did you think when you heard Hey Jude? Oh, I thought it was incredible. Oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah. Do you think it wasn't in my head when I was flying on the airplane back? (laughs) (laughs) Stuck in your head. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Wow. Um, While you're telling stories, uh, another one of my favorite stories of yours is uh, Brian Wilson. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> telling on your ear um, yeah. the, the Brian Wilson story Beach Boys now I did a lot of things with the Beach Boys why is that the only thing <laughs> that only people I remember, remember? Well, because it, that's the one you told me and I'm just, <laughs> just sticking with it okay so uh, this was earlier um, I was the uh, head of single records merchandising at that time at Capitol and that meant that we released five singles every week and five, wow. five new singles every week. We had a monthly meeting. And uh, the only people, and they were brought before us, before the sales and merchandising and promotion people for opinions and stuff like that. But Brian Wilson is the only one that didn't have to, and he was his own producer. Everybody else had a staff producer at Capitol, pretty much. And Brian Wilson was the only person that didn't have to go through that. When he decided a single, he just That's came it. in and he told us what it was, and that was it. So <laughs> I'm sitting in my office, and he comes in, and he said, got this acetate in his sleeve, and he said, hey, want to, come on, I want you to hear my new, our new single. And so he's sitting at my desk, and I'm there, and my record player is behind me. I turn around and put the acetate on, and put the needle down and start playing it and Barbara Ann comes on. <laughs> now, you know, we were making some they were making some pretty cool records at that point and Top they records, and yes. you know, they were there was this friendly, healthy tension between them and the Beatles about, you know, yeah. so you have things like Sgt. Pepper and you have things like I mean, Good Sounds, Vibration, you know, this yeah. kind of, all this I don't can't remember sequence on things but he's playing this, I mean, I'm listening to this thing and I turn around and I say Brian You've worked so hard, and I'm telling you, this is a huge mistake, man. It's a huge mistake. Yes, you're going to just really destroy all the, well, the following you build up. I mean, because it was, it was this really funny little record that was recorded like a drunken party. I yeah. don't know what it was on a wall, just on a wall and a sack tape record. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> and uh, Brian was just staring at me when I'm telling him this, and when I get done. He kept staring at me, and he walked around my desk, picked up the acetate, carefully put it in the sleeve, looking at me, turned around, walked back to the door, and he said, this is our next single, and walked out the door. Wow. Ten minutes later, I get a call from their manager informing me that, and they're going to form the rest of the capital executive, that I no longer have anything to do with Beach Boy Records from that point <laughs> forward. <laughs> Okay, but I'm cool because, uh, you know, if you say any record's not a hit, you're 90% for sure going to be correct because most records aren't hits. Yeah. So I thought, okay, he'll find out, and then everything will be cool. Well, it went to number one in like eight days, <laughs> you know, something like that. Yeah. And uh, I heard the record in a mall here about a couple of years ago over the speaker, and I thought, 
that is a cool <laughs> record. <man." laughs> I love you know, that. Song. You know, well, but anyway, so. Uh, wow. I, I did other things with the Beach Boys. That's the only thing anybody well, remembers. Uh, okay, I'll give you a chance. No, Do you I have don't. a happy Beach Boys no, story? <laughs> no, I don't. No, were they easy to work with? Oh, yeah. Um, Mike Love was a little odd then, and Brian was becoming Brian. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you the brothers. Really. Actually, they were pretty unusual because we had the, the family thing in there, and you had just a lot of. And I was in Hawaii with them, and man, that was crazy. Just like trying to get get fire ants to walk on the straight row or something. But, you know. Okay. Um, all right. Let's stay with some capital yeah. artists. One, a favorite of yours, both yours and mine, um, Glenn Campbell. Yeah. Um, I remember you telling me a story one time. You guys had really been trying to make something happen yeah. for him on radio and just wasn't happening. If I rem- remember the no, story correctly. Correct. Yeah. Um, you guys, had, the execs had gone to lunch on your floor, and you came back, got off the elevator, and Everyday Housewife, Glenn Campbell. Was, no, it was uh, by the time I get to Phoenix. Oh, was it Phoenix? Yeah. Okay, I was thinking yeah. Housewife. Yeah. Okay. I guess that makes more sense. Yeah. But it was playing the secretaries that had stayed behind. Yeah. We had been close to, we had Glenn Campbell under a seven-year contract. Wow. Now, in those days, you stayed with your artist, you believe him. Everybody loved Glenn Campbell. They they played his records. Uh, disc jockeys loved him, uh, but nobody ever would walk in and put their money down on the table and buy buy his record. We just couldn't sell. And so we come to by the time I get that. Well, then we had. Now you know more about. I have a problem with sequence of events. Mm-hmm. It was gentle on my mind. Yeah. And we did pretty good with that record. Okay. Not giant, but we did pretty good. And then we followed that with by the time I get to Phoenix. I'm pretty sure okay. here. Okay. So, but we can't, it's just not quite happening. But every time I would get off the elevator, because Capitol's a round building right. and it's all open, the secretary sat outside the, we had secretaries in those days. Right. And outside the offices, well, when those guys are out doing our stuff, uh, they would be playing records on the record players in our office. And every time I got the elevator, some secretary is playing by the time I get to Phoenix. And uh, in our binoc- vernacular in that day, it sounded like it was a chick record. You know, yeah. <laughs> the girls like it. So yeah. I just called up the, the promotion team. I had 50 guys in the field, and I said, we're staying on this thing this time. And, uh, of course, it did really well. Then we came back to Gentle on My Mind and made a real hit out of it because we had, you know, and then we had uh, Everyday Housewife, which I had another one of the things I tried to talk them out of releasing because he had this little record called Wichita Lineman sitting yeah. there. And I tried to talk them out of doing Everyday Housewife next because I, I really felt Wichita Lineman was the bigger record. But uh, anyway, so this is at the end of... Glenn's seven year, you know, Contract. six years, it's options to pick it up, keep it for seven years. Now, Capital finally breaks him and they have to go in and renegotiate, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he went from like probably would do anything to stay on the label to be, right. really <laughs> demanding a giant. And we did simultaneously the thing with Lou Rawls. We stayed with Lou that long and everybody loved him, but we couldn't get a real hit with him. And then towards the end of his contract, uh, Love is a Hurting thing comes along. So Capital had to negotiate in a matter of months two major contracts of artists they might have dropped, you know. Interesting that artist development and commitment yes. and loyalty yes. was something that yeah. was a big yeah. was a big deal and not so much. Everybody anymore. loved Glenn at the label and he was, you know, and, and just everybody loved Glenn. They loved his music and uh, Yeah, I was and I, I've asked you over the years, tell me tell me something about about Glenn and you said he was just so easy to work with. Oh, he was. Glenn wanted to be Glenn loved the golf. And Glenn found that he could sit and do sessions all day and not travel and just uh, golf and make a lot of money playing sessions, you know. Right. And my understanding at the time was he really couldn't really read music that at that time. And he's playing with all these. And what he would do is he would sit in the studio and they'd start running the song down. You'd have the chart in front of him. And he'd pretend, oh, he's a string broker. And he would listen to the... To the first run through, run throughs, yeah. <laughs> get it up here, and then come back and play. But this is, you know, I don't know how true that is, but that's what. But uh, we had a, you know, I had another situation like Glenn at, at Apple, and there's a guy named James Taylor. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Now we made a uh, Peter Asher made a great record with him and Caroline uh, on my mind, and everybody loved it. Everybody played it. Nobody bought it. Wow. It was just one of those things. Yeah. Of course, then Peter goes over to well, was it Warner's? I think I don't remember. And starts cutting little things like fire and rain. <laughs> Sweet me. <laughs> but anyway. Wow. You and I have talked over the years, and I'm assuming it was George Harrison uh, during your time with the Beatles that got yeah. you involved in Eastern yeah. philosophy, Eastern yeah. religion, and you were um, you had a guru, and you had you know yeah. you were pretty well yeah. entrenched, right? Yeah. Um, and so you were deep into meditation. I would I'm assuming. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Once becoming a Christian, um, the scriptures are filled with particularly old scriptures about meditating on the word of God. Yeah. And it made it when it, last time I think I read it, I think as Christians we read that and go, yes, we should meditate on the word of God, but when it comes down to it, it's difficult yeah. to do. You would have been very disciplined in the art of meditation. Yeah. Because of that Eastern yeah. religion yeah. philosophy. Has that translated into your Christian life? This is almost Kind of complicated. I hope I can uh, translate this. Um, when I did become a Christian, uh, I couldn't meditate on Scripture. I had a real hard time because my meditation as a New Ager, and I was a New Ager for 10 years, is in meditation you are emptying your mind out. <clears throat> When you're meditating on Scripture, you're you're actually contemplating the Scripture, wow. and you're you're uh, contemplating on it and what it means, and maybe some other scriptures around it. You're really contemplating on the value and what the essence of what's being said. So you're really Take bringing in. something in. So I was afraid because I didn't understand the process. What I'm describing to you now. Because uh, I didn't have anybody to tell me what the difference was, I was afraid. Now as a Christian, because I had to totally forsake being a New Ager, uh, I was afraid if I started meditating, I would start doing my mantra and and inviting all the elements in, you know, of the New Age thing, and so I uh, I just couldn't meditate for a long time. And, wow. And. Uh, is a is a big difference. I think maybe it, instead of meditating on the, the word God's word, that you should maybe it's really a form of contemplation and and uh, you know sitting with the scripture and, Just, and chewing on the word. Yeah, and chewing yeah, on ruminating. The word. Yeah, you know, ruminating. it's more of that yeah, kind of a yeah. kind of a thing. I've always wondered that yeah. how that yeah. how that plays. But the thing that did happen, you know, God's the greatest economist of all time. And no matter what, not one moment is of your life is wasted if you eventually, you know, come to him and turn it over. And and there are experiences. And as a new ager, I was very disciplined. And I got up every morning. I uh, my body was clean. Uh, I sat down. I had a quiet time. I did my uh, readings. I did my meditation. I did if it was chanting. Uh, I did all these disciplines very every every morning. When I became a Christian, the next day I sit down, and I sit down. Okay, I've got to read the Bible now. I got to, and man, I sat down. I was already disciplined. That's I had the time frame. Right. I had the the thing about clearing my mind and the thing about uh, spending so much time every day. Starting my day off with that first, and so. It worked, and then, as I had no idea I was going to become a speaker and speaking on the road and writing books and stuff, is I could answer people's questions about being a new ager because I'd been there. It's like a heroin addict is a person, uh, a heroin addict who's become cured is the best person to talk to somebody that's not trying not to be a heroin addict more. Wow. Who could talk better to them? You know. So uh, when people start coming to me with this stuff, I say, you know, man. Okay, I knew I wasn't going to convince them. I, I, know, I knew how to describe. I just say, well, here's what happened to me. Right. You know, like, because uh, nobody could have talked to me. When I was a new ager, nobody could have talked me out of it. Yeah. So 
it's um, you wouldn't recommend going through the New Age Eastern philosophy thing in order to become a Christian no. and have those disciplines and things there. But for yeah. you, it yeah. it, um, it, yeah. it made course, the difference. I, you could never say, well, I wish I wasn't me. I wish I was something, somebody else. But as you know, because you introduced Phil Kagey and I, we're very dear friends. And I just wish that I would have grown up loving the Lord like he did and yeah. serving it all those years instead of the wasted <laughs> time I had. But then God used that time for, you know, I, ha- I have something. When Phil witnesses to people and I witness to people, I can't witness like he did and he couldn't witness like I did. So, Good point. You know, but if I had my choice, I would be a Christian all along, you know. But it's because— and I'm, I'm going to say this carefully because I, I don't certainly yeah. don't want to offend or anything else. But it's because of the things that you went through yes. that you are a huge magnet. Yeah, you're you're <laughs> the guy all of us as believers yeah. who grew up in the you know born in the '50s yeah. or whatever and came up through the '60s and loved the Beach Boys, loved Glenn yeah. Campbell, loved the Beatles. Yeah. Um, go, I know this guy, yeah. um, and so that's a thrill for us. But people, when you go to speak someplace, yeah. and they hear, yeah, this guy was a manager for the Beatles. Yeah. I'm kidding. Uh, was <laughs> I was a U.S. manager US of Apple manager Records. Of Apple Records. <laughs> <laughs> Do yeah. you understand that? That's yeah. what the title, <laughs> correct title is. Uh, well, no, th- that you're just, people want to hear more. Yeah. They want more and more and more. Yeah. And if you hadn't gone through that, you could be a very eloquent speaker, but if you, yeah. because of, of that experience that you had yeah. in your life. Let me boil that down. How this works is... I always start being brought into churches. And so I said, well, can we call this the Beatles, the Bible, and beyond? And uh, so that was a working title for my events. And uh, a lot of times people came because they just wanted to meet the Beatle guy. They wanted to, you know, and some people thought that maybe the church was just a building for the venue of the Beatles. You know, they didn't. Anyway, what it boiled down to is people would come in uh, to learn more about the Beatles, and then they would get my testimony. Now, a lot of people came to the Lord because of this, because the simple logic was, well, wait a minute, this guy was with the Beatles. He must know what he's talking about. And if he says Jesus is cool, I mean, he was with the Beatles. He should know about these things. Credibility. I had cred. Yeah. I had cred. That simple. And that's what God used, you know, with me. And... uh yeah, another Pretty. story comes to mind that, that's really twisted in into all of this. Tell the story about the young. Well, she wasn't a young girl by this oh time. Gosh, yeah. The woman that came and and yeah. uh, talked about praying for you for years. Yeah, this was uh, when I was doing this touring. We would do. I would do my testimony, and afterwards, the pastor would come up on stage and join me, and we would set aside a time that people could ask questions. And so I was speaking at a large church in Southern California, and because it was evening and they were in a, in, a, in a residential area, they had to close down at a certain time. They had to empty the parking lot hmm. and, they, you know, just as the rules of the um, area. And so we had run a little late that night. So when we got to the question and answer period, um, we were only going to have time to maybe take two or three questions. And a pastor called on this girl way in the back of the auditorium. And she stood up and she said, um, Pastor, I don't have a question for Mr. Mansfield. I just wanted to make a comment. She said, when I was a young girl, I grew up in the church. And I did everything. The church was my life. And every year we would go on a, a young girl's retreat someplace for a week. And uh, every every." Day and night we were there. There were activities, and and in the evening, Wednesday evening was especially much a lot of fun because the pastor always, the youth pastor always came up with something really cool that night. And so, one night we sat down, and me and my three girlfriends I came with uh, were together. And he said, "Tonight we're going to do something unusual." I said, "I'm going to pass around a hat, and you're each going to take a name out of that hat." And then before I tell you what's in the hat, I want you to commit to me right now that you will pray for the name you pull out of the hat. And you promise me that you will pray until you either have empirical knowledge that this person has converted and and come to accept the Lord as their Savior, or you actually uh, just know in your heart, you just promise that. 
So he passed out the hat, and he said the hat names in here is a group of very decadent young people. And he had the names of the Beatles and me and some people worked for the Beatles. And she said, I pulled out Ken Mansfield. She said, who's, you know, who's Ken Mansfield? What's, what's a Ken Mansfield? And he said, each of my girlfriends, we all pulled out the same name. And so I put that name in my Bible. He tricked me. He got me to you know, commit. I prayed through for Ken Mansfield's salvation all through the rest of junior high, high school, and in college, and I got out in the world. And he, she said, I started getting in the business world. I start, you know, kind of leaving my bringing behind, and pretty soon I forgot all about that. She said, I became very successful, and just this last year, my life has fallen apart. It's an absolute nightmare right now. I've never experienced anything so horrible in my life. She said, but during these last few weeks, it's I had this pulling like God said to me, hey, my child, remember, remember when you were with me? Remember how sweet your life was, how beautiful everything was, the friendships and everything that you did, you know, the joy you had? And he said, uh, I want you back. She said, I get up this morning, I open a newspaper, and there's an article saying a man named Ken Mansfield... <laughs> who was with the Beatles, is giving his testimony here tonight. And she said, I just saw God just say, hey, you think I forgot about you? You think, you know, I didn't hear your prayers? She said, so I'm just here to tell you, Pastor, I'm back. Wow. And so, and then, uh, (laughs) and the pastor, now this pastor of a large congregation, and we're both standing there, and we, (laughs) well, you take it, (laughs) you take it. (laughs) What we don't know to what say. to say. Uh, yeah. yeah, what is left? Yeah. Oh goodness, I hadn't planned to ask you about that story, but I, that's yeah. um, that's that's. But remarkable. that's just uh, things about how God uses it all wrapped up. Because she prayed for my salvation, and I ended up being part of her return to re-salvation, yeah. or whatever you want to or call prodigal. it. Oh, I don't want to get into, <laughs> yeah, into, was... into doctrine here. <laughs> Ken, if you if you hadn't got into the music yeah. business, hadn't worked for Capitol, hadn't yeah. even played guitar, and been in the town criers, your yeah. your group when you were uh, before working at Capitol, if you hadn't done that, what career path do you think you would have chosen? Well, I'd gone to um, <clears throat> the University of Idaho and then transferred to San Diego State University. I was getting a degree in foreign trade because. I'd always wanted to travel all my life. It's funny that the Beatles turned out to be the reason why I got to do that. <laughs> but I wanted to work for American companies overseas because this would be, I'd be all these romantic you know, places I'd grown up or read about growing up. And uh, it would be a good thing to have a Bachelor of Science in you know, business. And so that was my goal. I graduated from San Diego State and was in the town criers. I was playing the town criers then. And during the summer, I had to, I'd been accepted to Thunderbird, Thunderbird, which is, there are two foreign trade universities at the time in America. One was Thunderbird for people who wanted to go into business. And there was an American university where people wanted to go into foreign uh, politics. Huh. You know, so there's like two things. And I'd been accepted to Thunderbird, but I worked my way through college and when I graduated, I was I didn't have a penny, and so uh, the college called and said that the Saturn Sphere Pro Space Program want to hire one of our recent graduates. Would we recommend two of our recent graduates? So I took the job. So now I'm working in the space program. This is the early to mid '60s, right? So this the space is in program 61, is. Yeah. Yeah. So Kennedy has just made his to the moon and back before the end of the decade. Yeah. This We're is kind of new when in the it space. was really happening. Wow. And uh, the company I was working for was making the Doppler radar systems yeah. and working on those. And um, anyway, so I didn't have enough money to get in after I'd been accepted to go to Thunderbird that fall. And that's uh, when I met Bill Wagner, who was the manager, because I was out touring with the town criers and immediately I'd set up a little folk club in San Diego so so yeah uh, I tell people I went from uh, one space industry to another space industry <laughs> when I got in the music <laughs> but yeah I was all now the other thing is about how God uses our time I was disciplined 
to work by working in the space industry. I mean, we got to work at seven o'clock in the morning, and we were on the clock, and we left at five or whatever it was. And uh, so when I got to work at Capital, all the guys there, the promotion men, man, they were out schmoozing all night, you know, and they'd show up around eleven o'clock and hang out at Aldo's. <laughs> Uh, the, you know, tell sea stories with each other, and I would be in the office at seven o'clock. I'd be going by the disc jockeys and bringing the all night jocks, bringing them donuts and coffee. And you know, I was on the job, man. And uh, I lasted in uh, in the field nine months before I was brought into the Capitol Tower. <laughs> wow! Because I was my district was just going, you know, gangbusters. So, if you could go back to that kid, yeah. In, in Idaho. Yeah. 17 years old? Were you still when in Idaho? I left, yeah. If you could go back and have a conversation with him, maybe take him to lunch and sit him down and just have a good conversation with him, what would you say to 17-year-old Ken Mansfield? I would uh, – this, this is a good question. I've actually never been asked that before. Um, I wish – my father was a lumberjack and then worked in the sawmills and uh, – in Idaho, those days, you graduated from high school, you got married, and you left the house. If you didn't leave, your my room would have been rented if I would have <laughs> left, probably. But uh, uh, I had no instruction at all of any kind. The only thing I had, my father shared with me, he said, your man's word is his most valuable asset. Never go back on your word. And that was my whole instruction. But I didn't know about uh, success. I didn't know about managing money. I didn't know about investing. I didn't know about uh, uh, what you do with the assets you're given. And uh, I just didn't know how to manage my life, you know. And so um, I would uh, tell that young kid to get organized, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what word. Would you uh, said whatever it takes stay in school or whatever it takes yeah. avoid this yeah. this pitfall or yeah, yeah. whatever it takes do yeah. this or that or yeah. whatever because i had all the success i mean i uh the only reason i got accepted university of idaho is if you're a resident and you graduate from idaho high school you're, you're accepted. automatically accepted <laughs> so i didn't have any grades and and now i'm working my way through college and uh I made gangbuster grades, and I was very active in college, and it was important to me. Oh, well, see, I left. I joined the Navy when I was 17 to get out of get out, of, and so I became a medical corpsman really? and a surgical technician. So I'm working for all those years with doctors and nurses, educated people, and here I'm this cowboy, you know, from, and uh, <laughs> I thought I want to be like them, and so then when I got out. And found out I could go to college. Did I, you travel with the Navy? Uh, on the Seattle Bremerton Ferry, that was it. I got <laughs> I was stateside the whole time because <laughs> I was working in uh, hospitals and stuff. You know, so Ken, back to your Beatle days. Um, you you had a friendship, a relationship with each of the Beatles. Yes. Besides the other people, like Apple Records, yeah, and, yeah, and so on. Can you you got any stories or just mem- what are your memories? Of relationships with them. Well, it just uh, started out with George, and there was a very special, he was a sweet man, and the reason I became a New Ager is not he talked me into it, it's just by what he presented to me. And I, I knew what, you know, he had a guru and all this stuff, but it was just his very nature that uh, when I came to a crisis in my life and knew I needed something, as I became a, a New Ager, uh, got me a guru. Now, it wasn't Maharishi and it wasn't George said I should that, but right. he just, um, he talked to me. Uh, just, he was just, I don't know, I wanted to be kind of like him, you know. And uh, Ringo and I, I, Ringo just, he's the guy that you become a pals with, you know. He was always kind of the clown and stuff like that. And as I said earlier, I just couldn't wait for us just to be friends later on, you know. Right. And, uh, and we ended up spending the longest time together because he moved to L.A. right away, and we went through all the, the drug period and our lives falling apart and our marriages falling apart and, and getting together and coming back together. I rep- represented him again in the 90s. Um, but, I mean, so we had a long relationship. And um, Paul was the guy that actually brought me into Apple because he, I mean, he's the one I spent the time with. And he was kind of like, uh, in high school, I'm sure he was the K-1 
campus hero and in college. I mean, he was, I'm sure he was student body chair. I don't know. Yeah. Paul was the instigator. It seemed like everything we did was Paul initiated. With the you know. charm or that yeah. would bring everybody together. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. and then John, I picture, I sometimes picture the guys in high school and what they were like in high school. And John would be the guy standing over by the Coke machine all by himself, just looking and kind of, you know, snarling at everybody or something. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, I always thought that I got close with all of them except John. I never thought, thought I don't think John likes me. And uh, I was, uh, we went to London many years later because there, there was talk about reorganizing Apple with the original people. And so I was in London for meetings. And I'm sitting with Ron Cass and Neil Asimov. And we were talking about the guys. And I said, yeah, except I just never felt I got kind of close to John because I didn't think he liked me. And Cass went, are oh, you talking about he liked you best of the four guys? <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, uh, what it was was John was uh, felt comfortable to be himself with me. So I always thought he was hor- just really on my butt about doing things, you know. Right. And he would he just, I don't know, he just fe- he felt natural with me. That's what it was. And he was very cynical. He really wanted to accomplish things, but he thought his fame would move him. He could do more with his fame, but he couldn't stop world hunger by himself, you know, right. and all these things. So um, he started up Zapple Records. and Zapple? Yeah, and that was his way of expressing himself. He kind of brought me into that right away, so I was his contact on that. But he was always, I was never doing things fast enough or good enough for John, it seemed like. So, anyway. But he would call you, I've heard you say that that he saw a pair of glasses on, or sunglasses or something on television the night before, and he'd call you and say, hey, can you get me a pair of those? Yeah, exactly. Those kinds of things. Yeah, well, when Paul came back with that pair of sunglasses, then, too, John wanted a pair like that. But, I mean, George would call me and say, now I'm vice president of MGM, and MGM Movies is selling all the the prompt. Uh, props from movies like Gone with the Wind. Wow. And they were just getting ready to uh, decorate Friar Park. So he said, uh, and I told George once, I, I, for me Friar personally. Friar Park was, was George's home, right? Huh? Friar Park yeah, yeah. was George's home yeah. in London. The big, the big place. And I told, I think Patty Harrison to this day, and I say this in front of me, was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. I had never she was just so. I told George once, you know, if you ever, <laughs> you ever get tired of her, man, give me a call, you know, <laughs> like that. And so I get a call from George in Hollywood, and he uh, says, "Hey Ken, could you do me a favor?" And I said, "What?" Well, he said, "Well, I'm sending Patty over for about five days. Would you mind spending the time with her and just make sure she's okay?" Take care. Baby. And uh, the reason was, yeah, is that. Uh, they needed an invitation. To, it was a private auction for the, all the, the stuff from the movie set. And so he wanted me to, to get her into get her. the auction so he, they could buy stuff for that. And okay. uh, this is um, when I set up Hometown Productions. That's Ricky Nelson and Chris and Christine Nelson and myself and then Patty and George. And they came to my launching of my, my new company. And, uh, but That's cool. That was, that was a... <laughs> Yeah. Interesting day. Yeah, and Patty and I actually got reunited here about five years ago. Really? We, I finally did one of those Beatle Fests, and she did it, and Donovan did it, and, and Billy J. Kramer. So it was just a whole bunch of us that, that did that thing together. And so it wow. was fun. Yeah. And she gave me this big slurpy kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I waited a long time for that. <laughs> now we've got a <laughs> yeah, slurpy no. kiss. No. Uh, I did pretty good in that area. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. In fact, that's that's where I wanted wanted yeah. to go to um, go to next. Your your story. Uh, we've talked about you know where you've come from, where you've been, all the, the stuff that's happened in your life. There's no more significant story. Yeah. That's that's part of what Ken Mansfield is about and who you are. Yeah. Um, Connie comes into your life. Yeah. Tell about meeting her and seeing her and, and just the courtship and the whole. Just do yeah. the story for me. Well, my life uh, totally fell apart. I mean, I was doing so well 
with moving up in the companies and you know being involved in all these careers and I thought one day well if I'm doing all this why don't I set up my own company and make the big bucks for myself you know <laughs> come on here so I uh, that was picture you just showed was me announcing my new company hometown productions and um, so I was getting pretty crazy by then but uh, I set up the company and uh, I would produce Waylon uh, and I Jennings. had the company and Jesse Coulter and uh, the Hager twins from Hee Haw, uh, uh, Claudine Langer, uh, Don Ho, David Cassidy, uh, you know, a lot of people. But for some reason, things started falling apart. I had no idea. I couldn't figure out why. I'm just, um, I'm not getting the hits anymore. The money's not coming in. The money is really going out because... I have this company, and pretty soon uh, I was just partying hard. Uh, my peers were a lot of people that shouldn't be my peers, you know, and uh, just the whole culture, I got immersed in it. And um, one day my company went under and took me under with it, and I went from having uh, the, uh, the estate up in the Hollywood Hills in Laurel Canyon with uh, the main house and three guest house and 13 acres of land around me, and you know, all my wife was an Italian actress at the time in The Godfathers, and we had, you, you wouldn't believe the people that were in that house all the time. It was everything from Diane Keaton to Roy Orbison to Ringo to, I don't know, just wow. Leonard Nimoy. Uh, just, it was just, anyway. So when it fell all apart, I lost everything. I had a 10 acre summer home on the ocean up in Mendocino County, and uh, I was just, I went dead broke. I mean, I just lost everything. So I said, I'm going to go back to now. Oh, and I couldn't get a, I couldn't, for some reason, the doors were shut on me in Hollywood. Now, I'd never been fired, never failed, never made enemies on the way up. But for some reason, I couldn't, I couldn't make my way back. And I thought, oh, I thought, I'll go back to work for the companies again. There just weren't any job. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to Nashville and I'm going to start all over with, where I left things off with Waylon and the Outlaws and all that. I'm going to go back there. I'm going to get more stoned, chase more women, be more decadent. I'm just going to blow it out back there, you know. I get off the plane with three cardboard boxes and three suitcases and heavily in debt and a bad reputation. Wow, that's all you had. That's all I had. If I'd have put an ad in the newspaper looking for a wife, uh, no sane woman would have answered it. <laughs> and I thought... You know, I'm, and, and my wife had left me in, in L.A., and my life had fallen apart to that point. And uh, I get off the plane, and Tom Paul takes one, Tom Paul Glazer take one look, takes one look at me and said, man, i got to get you in the studio. You're a mess, you know. He said, I'm starting a new album. So I started working on his album and uh, um, cra crashing at a friend's place. And I flew in on a Sunday, started in the studio on Monday, and on Wednesday, I took uh, a break uh, of working on Tom Paul's album with the engineer. And we just went down to a local music row hangout there. And, and uh, the engineer was a gay guy. And uh, we're sitting there. And he goes, wow, look at that. And this girl <laughs> walks in the door with a girlfriend. And it was Connie. And... She sits down, and I can't keep my eyes off her. Now, if a gay guy picks out a, a, a girl for you, <laughs> right. you know, yeah, you know, he, he uh, anyway. That's an endorsement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I, I just I couldn't take my eyes off her, and I was not interested in a relationship at all. It's the last thing I needed. But her girlfriend gets up and walks into the bathroom, so I go over and because I am a gentleman. And I said, I just, I come over to apologize to you because I know I've been staring at you since the minute you came, you came in here. And it's very rude. And I just want to apologize for that. I want you to be uncomfortable. And uh, my name is Ken Mansfield. And if you'd like my phone number, uh, I'll give you my number. Or <laughs> Right. If I had one. I... <laughs> <laughs> but could I get your number? Yeah. And, uh Anyway, uh, I did get her number. And so then the girl that she was with, Connie, was had 
been really setting herself aside in her walk with the Lord for a year. And uh, the girl she was, and she was working on a television uh, project, and the girl she was had with, she, Connie, was witnessing to. So here we are. I'm this stone guru. Eastern. You know, just a mess. And here's Connie, like really one of the best points in her life. So I thought, well, this is Wednesday. I'm not going to call her right away. I'm going to wait till next week. I start calling her. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to call her till the weekend. And so I call her Saturday morning. Uh, no answer. I call her Saturday afternoon. No answer. I call her Saturday evening. No answer. I thought, uh, she's got a boyfriend. <laughs> oh, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. I called her Sunday around noon. No answer. And I thought, oh, gee, they're off together on a weekend or something. <laughs> this is a lost cause. Well, she answers Sunday night. And she said, oh, hi, and uh, I've been up to Kentucky visiting my parents. I go, yes, you know, <laughs> good, visiting her parents. That's good. And we started, we had our first date on, on Monday night, and we've been together ever since. Now, we had a problem from the start because, uh, well, everything boiled down to this same argument. Jesus is the way or Jesus is a way. And uh, she said Jesus is the way. And I said— And you were happy to acknowledge that Jesus was a path, a—, a Well, yeah. So you were happy to concede. Yeah. I said, yeah. well, you know, uh, I think Jesus is one of the ascended masters. I think he's one of the greatest men, one of the great, great prophets and all that. So there's no problem here. And she said, well, he's the way. And I said, well, there's many paths, you know. <laughs> So, but right. the attraction was there, and we got deeper and deeper in the relationship. And uh, I wasn't what she was looking for, and, and I wasn't looking for anything, but it's just something that God put us together. And we dated for a while, and finally one night she called me. And she, and she we're in Nashville, so she's taking me to Belmont Church so I can see Rich Mullins. She's taking me to Petra concerts. She's taking me to, to um, oh, gosh, I forget all the uh, striper because yeah. she, she's trying to get me to, you know, she's taking me to all Music, these places yeah. and she's taking me to uh, churches that have all the great, you know, the musicians that play in bands and stuff. They're all there. So the, right. she's trying to get to me through the music. But uh, finally one night she calls me and she said, I need to talk to you. And so we get together and she said, uh, I cannot be unequally yoked. And I see what our, where our relationship is going. And she said, I have to make a choice between you and Jesus, and I choose Jesus. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because I knew how we felt about each other. And she had been witnessing to me, and I was kind of starting to, if it was a meter, you know, I was kind of maybe up to about 40% <laughs> yeah. of kind of getting this Jesus idea in a different way. And she did that. And I... I thought, I want to want something as badly as she wants something that I'd be willing to give up something that I truly care about on a deep level. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I've never wanted anything like that. I was willing to give up something really important to me. And that old needle just went right past 50. When he hit 51, I was all in. <laughs> I mean, it was just, I was all in. So I tell people when I wake up in the morning, the first person I see is the person that saved my life, you know. Yeah. And so we did. We dated for three years properly, and we got married. And we've been. Uh, we just. We'll have our thirty-fourth anniversary here in a, about three months. Wow. So, yeah. And uh, that's amazing. But uh, what she did, and I talked about George by by his mm -hmm. witness of his character, he attracted me to something. Yeah. She had been talking to talk to me, and she would pray over me, and she just kept at it. But what she did, she walked out the walk. She did more than talk about it. She walked it out, and uh, that's where the difference was. And I became the spiritual head of her household. I didn't read anything except the Bible for three years, and I wasn't being a fanatic. I just needed to catch up. Right. You know, I needed to— uh, I became a media tither. I quit cussing. Now, come on, I was with Waylon five years in some rock bands. I knew how to. I knew you could keep up. Yeah, I knew how to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there were just certain things he delivered me from immediately. There's other things I'm still dealing with, maybe prideful things or things you know, being judgmental at times and stuff like that. But 
there was just an immediate knowledge of, you know, that he, I had been changed. So um, Now, if you can top that. Let's <laughs> well, no, actually, I think I am because oh. um, this is a book, the, la the, the most recent book. By top of that, I mean, important things in my life. Well, yeah, I'm yeah, going yeah. there. Yeah. Just okay. hang on. Hold okay. on. Take a sip of water. <laughs> most recent book from Ken Mansfield. He's written, I think it's your seventh book. Seventh book, book yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll, I will talk about this specifically in a minute, but I just want to... I, I refer to him as my favorite roofer because um, he was on the roof of that yeah. last Beatle concert in 1969 yeah. in January. Uh, but if, if there's a pinnacle in rock music, yeah. that's it. Yeah. So <clears throat> you're on top of the world. But there is a day uh, specifically, and I know there were several, but one that really strikes, I think is really in your mind. I've heard you tell this story about being on your knees and um, at Starwood in oh, Nashville. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a... Um, a story about it. it was a humbling thing, and I hope you don't mind telling that story. Well, I I think you're talking about the Whitney Houston concert. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was so broke when I came to Nashville that I did get a job uh, stagehand at Starwood Amphitheater. Now here's somebody that's been to the very top in the industry, and yeah. usually you start out in places like that. I'm almost 50 years old now, and here I am schlepping amps and in the bowels of these trucks and, you know, giant trucks loading equipment and flying the sound. And those and, days start early, and they end very late. Yeah, so it's and a, you went, we were non-union, so you didn't necessarily get breaks. If you were running late, the show went up at 7. That was it, you know. Wow. Didn't really matter. So Wendy's show was, we were pretty late bringing that up so i hadn't had a break all day it was probably i think it was like august or something you know with really all the humid and hot and and uh so i'm standing in the wings and because we were we stood by just in case something happened and whitney walks out and she starts singing her song and she stops and she stands back she did not like the way her monitors were giving her her vocal or she just didn't like what she was hearing she stepped back and she wasn't going to sing another note until that was sorted out and she turns around and she signals for a stage hand to come out well i had to be the first guy standing at the edge of the curtain and uh i was going i ain't going out there you know <laughs> i mean i used to be a big deal in this town at one time and, and the big deals in nashville oh, were sitting on the in those days and of course you know it's empathy start with empathy the front row because it went back like a pole which really just about here is really close to the stage. Yeah. And so I was going to turn around and shove one of the other young bucks out there. And I'm a new Christian. And it's like God said, no, no, you get your happy buns out there because uh, <laughs> I'm in charge of this. And you get out there and you do this tonight because we have a problem with you and his pride. And you need to work on that tonight. <laughs> I went out there. In order for me to arrange her monitors, I had to get on my knees to, to you know, to make them the way she liked them. I get on my knees. I am so dirty and greasy and grungy. The sweat's just running down my face. And I look straight out, and here are the pre presidents and name producers, all the people I used to be one. I used to sit in those rows with those people. And I'm looking straight in their faces, and I'm going... I look up with a nice guy and I say, Lord, this is the single most humiliating moment in my life. But I get it. I got it. I'm, I get it. Game on. I arrange those monitors like monitors have never been arranged in the history of rock and roll. They still <laughs> talk about Starwood Amphitheater. And those monitors, the way they were arranged at that Whitney Houston concert. I just, you know... <laughs> And Connie says of anything I've ever done that she's that's the proudest moment she's has in remembrance of me. But um, I just um, that's amazing. Yeah, and things you have to go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> God right. loved me so much. Yeah, that he knew I had to be broken. He's, he's spanked. And bro yeah. Broke to be broken, you know. So, and it was necessary. Yeah, and it made you who. Yeah, brought you to the place yeah. where you are. Yeah, a guy who'll never work in the stagehand again. <laughs> <laughs> no. At least, well, for Woody Houston. For sure. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> ah, I forget it. Um, let's talk about some books. This was the first book. You know, this yeah. has been coming up on 20 years. 20 since years. 
the Beatles Bible and Bodega Bay. Yeah. Um, I, I remember when I read it, and it's got some wonderful pictures of the rooftop and you and the Beatles. There's that picture of you and Paul walking in, in step. And, yeah. and uh, um, when I read this, when I first got it, I thought, okay, it's got some cool Beatles stories in there, some great stuff. But then it's like reading the Psalms <laughs> because you're talking to God and you're you're experiencing. You were living in Bodega Bay, I suppose, yeah, when you wrote right, this, right? Right. And um, it's just you and your and your thoughts, things that we're yeah. going through. So it's it's a wonderful, wonderful read. Um, Thank you. Anything else you want to say about this? It's just my first book. It was totally inspired. Um, I was uh, going through another rough period and. Um, so I would uh, walk down on the beach every day. I was living in Bodega Bay at the time and uh, having these conversations with God. And so I was, I don't know, I'm not a journaler, but I had just gotten a new computer. So I'd come up and I'd start writing my thoughts down, these co- thoughts on the computer about my conversations with God. And one day on the beach, I thought, well, I'm really struggling, feeling like I'm washed up here now at a later age. And maybe if I write about myself when I was on top of the world, maybe I can put these two people together. And the result was that book. And a long story on how I got that published. But But you didn't set out to be a writer. No, no, not at all. And then when I did write the book, and it did become a successful book with uh, Brahman Holman, a major, major publisher, I thought it was a one-off. I mean, I'm ready to just go on to the next thing. And um, <laughs> the vice pre- senior vice president, Brahman Holman, took me to lunch one day, and he said, uh, by the way, he said, I just want you to know you're an author. I, I thought, uh, no, I'm not <laughs> an author, to- you <laughs> poor deluded child, you know. Uh, I'm, I just wrote this thing. And he said, no, you're an author. And so that to me was like saying I was somebody special, you know. I mean, I just, anyway, so I wrote another book, <laughs> The White Book. The White Book. <laughs> this is, and this is cool. Um, I, I don't have, and this is out of print now, right? Yes. It's going to be back in print next year, we think. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, like if you were a Beatles fan and had the White <laughs> Album, it's uh, got raised letter here, The White Book, and it's numbered. All yeah. of them were numbered, just like the album yeah. was. We numbered the first 40,000, so they're collector's items, yeah. Who got the first one? Uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, Connie, I Connie. guess. And, yeah. And I got the second one then. Abbey Ro- uh, Seville, um, the Apple, Apple Records yeah. on Seville Row in London, right? Yeah. It's now a... Oh, it's, it's now a... And that's already been closed down. It became a clothing store. Um, the children's clothing or something? Or, yeah. But didn't they have a little A little display? vestibule. Yeah, and they had this book sitting there. With was it the White Beatles. Book or the Bodega no, Bay? No, it was the Beatles Bible in Bodega Bay. Had that in? Yeah. And it's not something you or your publisher... Mine was on top of the pile, and uh, Jack Oliver, a friend of mine from Apple, sent yeah. me a picture of it. But... Uh, All right, I'm trying to get these in order. Is Philco next? No, 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 no. Um, between Wyoming's. Okay. Between Wyoming's. Um, this is just road trip. Yeah. And this is road trip of Ken's life, right? Yeah. This is. Well, it, why Wyoming's? I've always kind of wondered that. Well, I grew up in Idaho. Right. And uh, so of course it'd be Wyoming. <laughs> no, but my I was born in Pennsylvania in Wyoming County, Pennsylvania. Oh. And okay. so I went out on this road trip, this imaginary, as part of my imaginary road trip. I did, I put a bunch of things together to make one continuous road trip. And uh, so I thought I was heading back to Idaho and I was getting ready to go through Wyoming. And I thought, you know what? I was born in Wyoming County and I'm headed for Wyoming. I'm between Wyoming's right now <laughs> in my mind, you know. Yeah. And it's a road trip where, uh, Connie and I get in this van called Moses, and we head out, and we'd be driving along, and I would hear a Glen Campbell record, and then so I would uh, tell a story about Glen Campbell, and then we'd be out in the middle of the desert, and I would tell about a conversation with God, and then I'd be in Nashville, and I would tell a Waylon story, and then, you know, so I just, this uh, music, it's called my, uh, Between Wyoming's My God and an iPod on an open road, so I had this music playing the whole time. Uh, but again... Personal, yeah, yeah, things that happen, yeah. stories about you. Oh yeah, That's this 
is, and this is next, right? Yeah. Stumbling on open ground. Um, this is this gets a whole lot deeper and personal, not yeah. just the fun stories and stuff. Yeah. Tell about this book. This is my battle with cancer. I've had two major cancers. Um, the first one I was given one to three years to live. And, uh, of course, when they told me I had one to three years to live, I heard the one part <laughs> and thought it was over. But they tried some experimental treatments on me, which has now become a mainline uh, treatment for my cancer. It's a very rare bone marrow cancer, and uh, it's not curable still. But uh, I was diagnosed in 1996, given one to three years, and I'm still here. Cause, 24 years and I'm later. Getting, I'm getting ready to go, to go back into that treatment because my numbers have gotten bad again. And, but the and, one to three have turned into at least so yeah, far 20, yeah, yeah. 24 And, you know, years. God told me, he said, you know, you pray to me, but you limit me. You kept begging me to have a Hezekiah experience where I would give you 15 more years of life. <laughs> and now we're at almost 20 years, uh, you know, so why don't you just let me do it my way? You know? <laughs> uh, that's good. This one's next, yeah. right? The Rock and a Heart Place. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the, the, the subtitle. Um, a rock and roller's coast, uh, rock and roller coaster ride from rebellion to sweet salvation, yeah. which is your story for one. Yeah. But you talk to several prominent yeah. rock and rollers. Um, yeah. yeah, read some of them on there. Can you see? It? It's on the front too, I think. Buffalo Springfield. Oh no, passionate stories, revelation from members of Buffalo Springfield, which would be Roger McGuinn. Yeah, no. In this case, it was Chris Hillman. Chris Hillman. Okay. Yeah. Um, the birds. That would be Hillman. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the birds. That was Hillman. Uh, Buffalo Springfield was. Uh, who was it? Oh well. Anyway. Oh well. <laughs> England and John Ford Coley. Yeah. Talked to John Ford Coley. Great guy. Grand Funk Railroad. You had um, yeah. Mark Farner. Uh, Mark Farner. Yeah. Kansas would have yeah. been. Uh, uh, it wasn't uh, Kerry. It was uh, John uh, Elfonte. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Corn. Oh well, who would that be? Yeah, I'm just uh, well, Brian. I, I gotta say, I'm I'm I was never. I think I heard of Corn through this book, yeah, okay. so I wasn't really familiar yeah. with them. But that's just yeah. I was Letterman, and this is Beatles yeah. as far as that's concerned. Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, well, it's from his band. It yeah. was his bass player. Yeah. Okay. Pointer Sisters. Yeah. Ruth Ruth Pointer. Yeah. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, of taking you up for an interview. Yeah. Um, in north uh, north of Nashville and uh, Leonard Club, yeah, yeah, yeah with uh, yeah. Scott Ross, and Ruth was there, yes, and got to meet her. What a <laughs> lovely, yeah. lovely, lovely woman. Yeah, she's uh, Prince. Yeah, Mendez, that was Des Dickerson, right? From Prince, the Ronettes. Yeah, which was a uh, Scott's wife, yes, Nedra. Nedra, Nedra, yeah, and the Turtles, Mark, yeah, Ballman, N yes, Mark. yes, yeah. Um, it's their it's their story. Um, these people are all famous rock and roll bands and uh, have gone the full route, you know. And so it's me chatting with each one of these people. And But great. Still in print, right? Still, yeah. Still oh, available. yeah. Okay. Now, these are real. This is nonfiction stuff so far. Yeah. Now. My first fiction book. Fiction. This is Philco. Um, where did this come from? The idea uh, this? That came from my past. This is the best thing. For me, as a writer, the best thing I've ever done, and I took stories from my past growing up and characters and things that happened to me in my life and developed a central character that, through his wanderings, met each of these people. And then I just embellished their stories. Uh, to give you an example, when I was growing up in school in Idaho, there was a kid that would never talk. We're in grade school now. He wouldn't, you couldn't get him to talk, and he'd go up by himself all the time during recess. And I cornered him at the water fountain one day. I thought, I'm going to get to know this guy, and why won't he talk? Right. And he was a young Indian kid. And uh, he finally talked to me because I just pestered him. And he said, uh, I was told that we are given so many words in our life when we're born, and we, we use up those words, we die. And wow. he said, I want to live a long time. Wow. Now, I took this and projected it further and created this character. And uh, in the book, me, 
with not me in the book, but, and become close friends. And uh, what he said in this story was the fact that he found out, though, that God didn't count the words that you use when you talk to him. So you could use as many words as you want talking to God. <laughs> and that's why he would leave at recess and go out and run in the fields, and he'd go out and talk to God. Then you come back, he wouldn't talk to the rest of us. <laughs> but it was, ex- wow. you know, there's much more in the story than that. But I just took these real experiences and expanded them, you know, into, into fictionalized real-life stories. So there's a heart of each story. Was it a stretch for you because you'd done so much in nonfiction? Was it a stretch or was that just something that was inside of you? It took me 18 years to write that book. Really? I just, it was something in me. I wanted to write it, but I could never put it together, you know, and it took that long. So, wow. But it's, uh, I don't know. I could go back and read that book and cry in my own book. Just, I don't know. You know, things, God gives you things and they're, they're so special. It's, it's like you didn't even do it. And you've talked to millions of musicians and writers that say, I didn't have anything to do with it. Right. It just came from God. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And back to the, the to your latest book, seventh book, um, The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert. And the cool thing is, where somewhere it's in here, the title, oh, there it is, The Man in the White Coat, <laughs> which total total accidental yeah it's just one of those things yeah. but um in any of the rooftop pictures there's several of them and there's a guy in a silly white coat <laughs> on the roof there and um and that was yeah kind of accidental before you could tell that story you boy there's just tons of research it's not just what you experienced yeah. that day and you really just kind of quote unquote happened to be in london you weren't there because they didn't know they were going to be doing no this. no i was just happenstance I was just had to be working out of the offices. You had to be in London and working. Work, yeah, and and you heard they were going to be doing this thing on the roof. Yeah. It's like okay, went up, and if you hadn't gone up when you went up, it's very possible that you wouldn't have been able to go because not everybody in the office no. went up. I still can't. Well, there's only four of us who were up there that not shouldn't have been, but that had nothing to do except be there. Right, and that was me and Yoko and Ringo's wife Maureen, right, and Chris O'Dell, who was a, a girl okay. from. Uh, uh, Peter, she was Peter Asher's assistant. Right. Uh, she was from Arizona, so. But uh, <laughs> Another American. Yeah, but that day, because um, I'd been working on the, we were trying to find a way to do the last concert because we needed it for uh, the, the final c- concert for the film, Let right. It Be. Let It Be, right. And we just ran out of time, and so finally somebody decided let's go up on the roof the day before. But I'd been, I'd been helping or working with them trying to find places to, do this. There was talk about the desert, oh. the Sahara Desert, and, yeah. and all this stuff happened. They're talking about to getting to like the Queen Elizabeth, the ship, the Coliseum, the Coliseum, a Greek Isle, uh, a flour mill. Uh, there was just tons of things. And Mal and I were working on the deserts. He was working Mal on Evans. the yeah Mal Evans. He was working on the Sahara Desert, and I was working on finding a one of like the Arizona deserts, someplace in right. in the middle. And so I was involved in that. Now I'm working in London, and uh, they made the decision to go up on the roof. Now, before, I'm in America, and they're calling me. Now I'm down the hall, <coughs> and nobody mentioned it to me. <laughs> and Mal walks in, the office I was using, and he said, Hey, Ken, we're going up on the roof in 15 minutes. I said, What do you mean? He said, Yeah, we're going to shoot the footage. Now, I'd heard construction in the building, and I just thought it was just maybe somebody remodeling an office. Right. It was January. It was cold. I would dress in what I was wearing in Southern California because I'd get on, I'd get off the plane, be right in a limo, you know, go to the hotel, limo back. I never worried about being outside and being right. cold. Right. So, oh my gosh, I'm going to be on top of a, a five-story, six-story building in the middle of winter. So I just ran out the door. The first store I came to, men's store, because there were a lot of them on Savo Row. I just grabbed, there was a, a dummy, there was this white coat there. A mannequin? A mannequin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it could be. No, I didn't mean to insult mannequins. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, didn't mean to insult a mannequin at all. But anyway, I bought it and grabbed it and got up on the roof, and 
I thought it was a top coat and it was a raincoat. So as soon as I got up there, the thing just froze, you know, because it was rubberized. And <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, so I'm the only guy up there that's not dressed basically in black, other than Ringo's red coat and George's green pants. Well, his red coat, his, his it was a rain slicker as well. Yeah, wasn't yeah. it? He borrowed yeah. from Marine. He borrowed it from Marine and. Yeah. John supposed well, John supposedly wore Yoko's coat, but they both shared that coat. And uh, <laughs> Paul just came up there in a the suit, and he didn't care. He, I couldn't believe he was just up there in a you know white shirt and a <laughs> suit jacket. But anyway, so it turns out I I stand out. If I'm if your camera's in my direction, you can see me. You're, yeah, your so eyes are drawn to you. I become known as the man in the white coat, and uh, witnessed probably was going to be one of the most historical moments in rock and roll. No yeah. question. No yeah. question. Did yeah. you have any idea while you were up there no. No. that it was going to be yeah. a huge thing? People look at me like I'm daft when I say it was just, it was actually just another day at the office. Yeah. And that's what it was. There were so many things going on all the time with the Beatles. You couldn't imagine what was going on in that building. Just It was just madness. Everything was just, all of a sudden, hey, we're doing this, there's that, you know. Uh, I'm in the studio with them while they're cutting. Uh, uh, the Hell's Angels are there, or uh, famous movie actors, or the Hari Krishnas. You know, it's just the place was just. And Derek Taylor's always holding court with all these uh, weird people, famous people, and stuff like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> there was a unique smell in the building that m- made you feel good. Uh, well, never mind. Yeah, yeah pass that okay. on. Move on. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I need to ask this question because in the interviews you've done, you said I ask you a question you've never been asked before. Is there anything else that you've that you thought, gosh, I wish somebody would ask me about? Is there anything else you want to say? Well, the Beatles are obviously the uh, it, the problem with the Beatles, and the, it was the good thing of the Beatles, but the problem with it was it defined me, and I did have a hard time with that later on because I could never. It was really, I had no idea how you know, giant it really was or would become. Um, So the thing that I wanted to know, and I've told you this story, I think, about me and George Harrison, is how kind they were to me and how normal they were. And especially when I worked with them at first, you know, we were so young and there was this innocence and this excitement. Uh, Paul, we'd get in a limo and we barely could get the door closed because we were teenagers and he, he said, I don't get it. You know, he was still really surprised about it. But I had a lot of responsibility because the Beatles were 50% of capital's business. And they had, now, if you own a company and a business, you do not want to have one client be part of 50% of your income because if you lose that client. Right. <laughs> so when they asked me to be the U.S. manager of Apple Records, uh, the pressure on me was giant. And Stanley Gordico himself, the president of Capital Industries, called me up to his office and to, to tell me that the Beatles, you know, Ron Cass had called. And he said, look, it, you do not have to give us a reason why you're in London or where you are anytime. You do not have to validate your expenses. Uh, you are free to do what you need to do as long as you keep it together with the Beatles. Wow. He said, Ken, let me put this in another way just so you'll understand what I'm trying to say. When it comes to the Beatles, there is no margin for error. Those are my walking papers. Now, I'm with the most famous guys in the world, and there's a lot of fun we had, but I could never totally relax. What if I made John mad at me and John said, get that guy out of here or whatever? And I got in things where they didn't agree, and I was caught in the middle of it, but... um, They treated me incredibly. They were very kind. It wasn't like, I'm a Beatle and you're not. It was once you're in one level of the inner circles, you know, some some degree, uh, you're one of them. You're part of the team. And uh, we're just all young guys, you know, in the middle. The way I can define that most is I was, uh, I think I was in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, because we were putting together Rick Hall's fame, fame records. And I get a call from uh, Gordico saying, Paul wants you in Apple tomorrow at 1 o'clock for a meeting. 
Well, in those days, because this is in the 60s, you know, traveling wasn't that quick and that fast. Right. And I said, well, I'm just, I don't have any extra cash with me. I'm just a few clothes. He said, you get yourself to New York City from Muscle Shoals by uh, tomorrow morning or something. I forget how, how the spread was there. And he said, I will go to your house and get your wife to pack you another suitcase I will fly to New York and I'll do a handoff with you I'll there. Your and it was just like, wow. it was crazy. And so I got there and it was really hard to figure out how to get to, to, Logistics, to JFK yeah. at that time and really meet him. And I jump on the plane and uh, I get to London. I have the meeting with Paul. And then that night they are, they're going to show Magical Mystery Tour up, upstairs. And I mean, I am dead. And especially when you fly east, you are just, yeah. You're a goner. And I'm upstairs, and there's the aromas in the building, and I'm standing there, <laughs> and I think I'm going to throw up. And I'm so tired. I think I'm going to faint. I think I'm going to throw up, and I think I'm going to lose my job. And George comes over, and I'm leaning against the desk. And he says, hey, Ken, when would you get in? And I went, well, I got a little while ago. Because <laughs> I thought if I talked, I was going to throw up. And he said, uh, where are you staying? And I said, I'm staying at the corner. And... Uh, he asked me one other question, and he just stopped, and he said, come on, man. I said, what? He said, you need to go get some rest. And uh, he took me over to the hotel. He and, took you? Yeah, and got me up to my room and took on my shoes. And I, was, and I'm, I said, George, I got meetings tomorrow. He said, don't worry, I'll cover for you. <laughs> Wow. And just uh, come in when you feel like it, man. Wow. Well, that was just a guy knowing the pressure I was in and, and just... Compassion. Just compassion yeah. and just took care of me. That's amazing. And so that's, um, for some reason, of all the things, that sticks out in my mind more than anything I experienced with them. What a great yeah. story and a great memory yeah. of, of, uh, yeah. of George. He didn't undress me, though. <laughs> okay, yeah, he, well, my shoes. Yeah. We'll, we'll cut that part out. <laughs> no. Shoes, yeah, that's it. No, no. So. Um, last question I want to ask. Okay. How do you want to be remembered? Whoa, maybe like that. Maybe as simple as that. And no matter what we've done, what we've gone through, you know, uh, the old saying, when you get up in the morning, everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. Uh, I think I have the common wish that everybody has. I would just like to be remembered as a kind, good person. And uh, I always kept my word. Wow. Flash I just back. thought of that. Wow. What I was telling you. Yeah. yeah. Your dad's? Yeah, I did. I kept my word. No matter what I did. Kept my wow. Wow. <laughs> Well, that's 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 pretty heavy. Yeah, that, that got me actually. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I just realized that. Yeah, that's amazing. You asked me two questions I have never been asked. So yeah. Well, I'm happy to have that. Okay. Um, Ken, I've, I always love being with you. I mean, I love Thank hanging you. with you. I love. I mean, the stories, if nothing yeah. else, because I was a kid. In fact, I've told you this before, and I'll say it again. Um, I was a, a teenager growing up in Miami yeah. Um, when you were making the decisions on what singles to be played on the radio and stuff. And I was listening to WQAM <laughs> um, in those days. And um, uh, Beach Boys, Beatles, and Glenn Campbell were my favorite wow. acts. And I didn't realize, oh, they happened to be on Capitol. Yeah. You happened to be helping pick the singles and subsequently helping me spend my allowance money. So... <laughs> I'm um, not going to pay you. <laughs> I no, knew this was going you, somewhere today. You've uh, <laughs> you've bought me lunches and dinners several times, so that that works out. That works out really well. But it it is truly yeah. an honor to know you. Not because your your past your past is fun. Your past yeah. is great to be connected with that because you are a man of honor and you well, are a man that you. keeps your word and you are yeah. someone that encourages me and and uh, yeah. constantly lifts me up. And uh, I'm grateful for your friendship. Oh, I'm just grateful too. I really am. Very much. God bless you. It's good to start crying. <laughs> Ken Mansfield uh, has been our guest. And uh, as we've said before, we're going to continue to do these and talk to people that have wonderful stories to tell. And um, join us when that happens again. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Wow. Human words can't describe, can't define what's come upon me. I attempt to make sounds for the whole Beyond me, love divine, you are mine.
the fire. 